Wait. What do you think, Lindy? Should we start? Trying to mute myself. Okay. Yes, you can go ahead uh, and start, I think, at this point. Okay. Is everybody muted? Thank you. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. As all of you know, or maybe don't know, my name is Ellen Fishburn, and I'm chair of the Communication and Church Support at the Presby of San Fernando in California, in case some of you are not in California. Today is the fifth of our educational series put together by our committee called Can't Hide Behind Being Controversial. Today's presentation is titled Lamenting Racism and it's presented by Rob Mathia, PhD. He's a professor of practical theology at Azusa Pacific Seminary. So before we have Rob start his presentation, let's join together in prayer. Lamenting God, we gather together to think about our role in the world. Leaders have led us in the past and we know prophets are with us now and will surround us in the future. Gratefully, we remember today the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We look to him as a leader who advocated for peace in all times and places this leader who wrote, only the word which serves the good and enriches the treasure of love in the world is like to God in truth and fulfills its commitment to the ideals of the divine pattern. We pray for our world, for leaders around the globe, as well as for those in Washington, D.C. in transition to rise to the cries of the people. We pay for, pray for strength and pairs of vision for our essential workers. We pray for the sick, the despondent, and the hungry. We pray for your light to shine as a beacon to peace, justice, and love. Bring with us as we learn, be with us as we learn tonight. Help Rob convey to us the meanings from your heart. We are grateful for this time and will work to move your mission forward in the world, even in the midst of a pandemic. With all confidence together, let us say, Amen. 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 Bob? All right. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you for opening us with that word of prayer. It's, uh, I appreciate being with you this evening. I want to thank my dear friend, Wendy Gist, for the invitation to be here tonight. And, uh, my understanding is that, that this presbytery has done a whole series of these sessions focused in different ways on, on issues of justice or racism. And I hope to build on that tonight as we talk about how lament can function as an anti-racist practice. Just a little heads up that towards the end of the time, there's going to be some, um, I'm going to ask you to put forth some energy so it's not just a uh, sitting here and taking it in, but there's going to be a time where I'm going to ask you to do some work which will involve uh, needing a pen or something to write with and a piece of paper. There was a handout emailed out. Um, you don't have to have that, but if you have it, um, it will have some, some of the passages that I'll be looking at are printed in that. And if you don't have it, you, you can always uh, print that out later so you don't have to write down all the passages as we go. Well, let me jump in. I want to begin by telling you a story about a friend of mine, Abigail who is a pastor in Covina. And several years ago, she and her husband, both of whom are white, adopted a little black girl. And babies grow up quickly. And in no time, Abigail found herself holding her daughter's hand as they arrived at school for the first day of kindergarten. And as they walked up to the school, her little daughter turned to her and said, Mom, why are all the brown children bad? How did this little five-year-old girl come to think that? She grew up in a family that loved, loves her deeply. Her parents chose to adopt her, which says something of their rejection of the racial hierarchies that play out in our culture. Her parents have worked hard on examining their own unconscious biases and prejudices. And yet somehow, in spite of their best efforts, their little black daughter got the message somewhere that all brown children are bad. 
And that's the question she, she asked her mom as she headed into kindergarten on her very first day. In all likelihood, I, I doubt anybody ever told her that directly, but if you've been coming to these events that your Presbyterian has been putting on, I'm sure that you are aware that racism gets communicated and lived out in ways far beyond the individual racist words that may come across. Somebody didn't have to say this to her directly. Racism is so pervasive that its values get communicated through the skin color of the heroes in our children's books. It gets communicated through the way black people are treated differently than white people in a doctor's office. I just read a study about this, that when patients report pain, doctors are less likely to believe the pain level stated by black patients compared to white patients. And the pervasive of racism shows up in the job market where research shows that a resume with a black sounding name gets 50% fewer calls for interviews than the exact same resume with a name that sounds white, 50% fewer calls. So the problem of racism in our society is more than like one person saying something racist to another. That is a problem, but it's much bigger. It's more pervasive and enormous, enormous, and we have to confront it in every way we can. As part of the anti-racism work that we are called to as Christ followers, I'd like to talk with you this evening about how the biblical practice of lament might serve as a powerful anti-racist practice. And uh, let me begin with a little background. Let me get my screen shared here and tell you kind of how this, my, my work with this unfolded. Okay. Let me see if I can. Hold on just a second. My, when I share my screen, some of my windows change sizes here. Let me just get things adjusted a little bit. Okay, so for the last three years, I've been leading a team of four local pastors. They're on the top row of this picture and four professors on the bottom row. And we've been studying together and carrying out congregational experiments to look at this question of how lament might serve as a tool in our anti-racism toolbox. It's a wonder, it was a wonderfully diverse team with um, you know, men and women, uh, people from different ethnic backgrounds. And uh, the second person, second from the left in that top row, I don't know if you can see my cursor, that's Abigail Gaines, Pastor Abigail. Story I just, one of, you know, I just told you uh, her story about her daughter's first day of kindergarten. And for the first year of, of our team, we met for a half day every month and we uh, read books together, we processed together, we shared experiences, perspectives, we prayed together, we ate together, we laughed together, we cried together. And we learned a lot from our time together. And out of that work, in our second year, we put together what we called church summits, two church summits, these were all day Saturday events with 40 people from our four pastors' churches. And for the first church summit, our focus was on remembering, and specifically remembering the lost, the, the, the forgotten history of racism in the LA area. And so we, we put together a bus tour for, the, for this Saturday and uh, went to a couple places around LA. We went to the Watts Labor Community Action Committee, which, I didn't know anything about until we started scouting around for places to visit. And um, pretty interesting organization in Watts. We met with the leaders there and they have a museum there uh, that highlights some aspects of racism that have played out in, in Los Angeles. And uh, we had time on the bus before and after traveling to do some exercises and processing. And uh, we also visited uh, a museum down by Alvera Street called La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. And um, again, I've been down to Alvera, Alvera Street a lot of times. I had never been to this little museum until we started poking around for ways to help our people remember some of the history of racism in our very own context. Right? For our second church summit, um, 
we had another Saturday event and this involved workshops and immersive experiences to expand on understandings of both racism and biblical lament. And that wrapped up with a, a worship service of lament. People were invited into that experience. And uh, let me just say a couple more things just by way of intro, I'm not gonna spend more time on, on that background, but we carried out these, these church summits for two reasons. First of all, in order to lament and specifically to lament, lament racism, we have got to remember well. We have to have eyes to see what is really going on. Okay, so part of the process of lament, we can't, we don't lament out of a vacuum. We, we have to remember uh, how racism has played out uh, when we come to lament racism in, in specific stories and uh, incidents and, and histories. And then of course, in order to lament well, we need to understand better what biblical lament actually is. And that's where I'd like to go this evening, spend most of our time focused on that. Uh, and while making some, so I'm not gonna do much with uh, understandings of racism and the background of that. You've been working on that in, in other sessions, but I'll, I wanna definitely make connections as we go. Lament to a large extent is a lost practice in the church today, but it has deep biblical roots. And here's kind of a, a little description of lament to get us started. Lament in the Bible is a way of speaking or praying to God that involves a heartfelt, raw crying out about a bad situation, about something that is wrong. It's a way of saying to God, here's the situation, and I'm not happy about it, okay? And I'm gonna flesh that out. That's such sort of a, uh, a working description. We find laments throughout scripture. We have a whole book named after this practice, right? The Book of Lamentations. The Book of Job is essentially one long lament, a crying out to God, right? About a third of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. And we get lament in different places in the New Testament as well. The one that, that uh, I think is probably the, the best known is, is the lament spoken by Jesus on the cross when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that is his personal lament, but it's also, he's quoting from Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 is a Psalm of lament. We'll look at that more in a few minutes. Let's look at some of the themes that come through in biblical lament, because this practice of crying out to God can take a number of different forms. And actually, that's one of the reasons I find it so powerful when, when we focus lament on racism is because people from all different social locations can use this practice of lament. If uh, a person who benefits from the system of whiteness can pick up lament and use the practice. A person who bears the brunt of racism can pick up lament and, and use it as a way of, of crying out to God. But there are some different themes that, that are probably more appropriate for some than others. So the first theme I wanna look at, the first theme of lament is that of repentance. Here's one example in Psalm 51. And if you have the handout, uh, that it's printed for you there as well. Here's Psalm 51 verses one and two. Have mercy on me, God, according to your faithful love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash me completely clean of my guilt. Purify me from my sin. So we talked about lament as a, as a way of crying out to God about something that isn't right. Well, the thing that isn't right here in this psalm is my own sinfulness, right? The, the psalmist is repenting, saying, I've, I've gone astray. I'm guilty and, and I need to get back on track. God, forgive me. Uh, these are, are also called penitential psalms. And when it comes to racism, there's a, a whole slice of our society that, that this, this type of lament would be appropriate for, a lament of, of repentance. My pastor friend, Abigail, shared as she reflected on, on her kindergarten daughter's question. You know, her daughter shows up at first day of kindergarten and turns to her mom and says, Mom, why, why are all the brown children bad? And, and Abigail wanted to jump in and try to fix it. Uh, and she realized that that was actually part of her white identity playing out, assuming she could jump in and fix everything. And that was her first response. But as she shared with, with myself and our group, 
part of her response needed to be lament. Part of her response, as she was able to step away and reflect on this personally, was to lament for the ways that she had participated in and blindly benefited from a system of whiteness that privileged her and that actually created a situation where her little black daughter experienced something really differently. So repentance is one theme that, that comes through in lament. Another is this theme of accusation. Psalm 44 gives us one example. Uh, and these are accusations actually uh, made of God, accusing God of things. Here's Psalm 44. You've made us a joke to all our neighbors. We're mocked and ridiculed by everyone around us. You've made us a bad joke to the nations, something to be laughed at by all peoples. So here, this is still crying out to God about something that isn't right, but the focus is pretty different, isn't it? Uh, we're mocked and ridiculed by everyone around us. And you've done this, God. You've made us a joke to all our neighbors. This is how the psalmist feels. And so cries out to God with this, with this accusation. It seems to me that when it comes to lament, lamenting racism, uh, there are, there's a, a big slice of our brothers and sisters, people of color, who have borne the brunt of racism, who, who may find that this theme in lament uh, works for them. It is the way that they, it is a form of lament that, that may uh, be, a, that they can use to, to voice what they're experiencing and feeling. You know, it's interesting to reflect on, on this, and there are a couple other themes that we'll come to that, that uh, I think are, well, they, they take us outside the bounds of what nice Christians do, right? Because the church has taught a lot of us that you don't talk to God that way. You don't accuse God of things. Um, but the psalmist does it. There's an honesty to what the psalmist voices. And through the laments we have in scripture, we are invited to be honest with God in the same way. Another theme that comes through in lament is the theme of abandonment. Lament can include cries of abandonment as we hear in Psalm 22. I already mentioned this. Jesus quoted these words on the psalm. This is a different version than I, than, than many of us are, are familiar with, but same idea. My God, my God, why have you left me all alone? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my anguished groans. My God, I cry out during the day, but you don't answer. Even at nighttime, I don't stop. I mean, the anguish in this, the pain, the, the abandonment that comes through is, is powerful. Uh, it's, it's emotionally just, just raw. And uh, I think that emotional rawness is, is a gift of lament. It, it invites us into that space in ways that, that some of the other anti-racist work, the, 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 I'll say this uh, at other places as well, but I don't think lament is, is the magical answer to undoing racism. And it's not like the tool uh, that, that surpasses all others. We've, I, I see it as one tool among many tools we need to use, but, but it does some unique things. And so uh, uh, I think it, it takes us into this emotional space in ways that some of the other anti-racist approaches that we need to be doing uh, don't take us. So for example, we've got to be working first on, on legislative issues. Uh, but as much as I try to be involved in those, those don't, those don't, uh, those aren't the channel for my emotional processing in the same way. So we need, we need multiple tools. Okay. Uh, let's go to another theme, the theme of despair. Uh, kind of related to that theme of abandonment. Here's a verse from Lamentations 1, 16. Because of all these things I'm crying, my eyes, my own eyes pour water because a comforter who might encourage me is nowhere near. My children are destroyed because the enemy was so strong. As, as I've already mentioned, scripture gives us permission to be brutally honest to God uh, about how we are feeling. And, uh, and the, 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 the author does that here. The author, and as part of the, the lament here, 
the author rehearses some of the history leading to the current situation, right? Listen, listen, my children are destroyed because the enemy was so strong. So the, the author is remembering what the enemy did. The enemy was so strong and created us a, a circumstance where my children are destroyed. I'm in this current situation. So again, this remembering is essential for our work of lament. Fear is another theme we find in lament. Listen to Psalm 6, 3. My soul is struck with terror by you, O Lord. How long? Right? So the psalmist names the fear. Right? I'm struck with terror. But notice also what's included here. There's a question. Lament, the, 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 the psalmist questions God. God, wh when are you going to show up? Help me. Lament gives us permission to question God. And for those who bear the brunt of racism, you might have some pointed questions for God in the midst of everything else you're feeling and experiencing. One more, the final one I wanna look at is protest. And I think this is particularly relevant given uh, the protests that have gone on uh, throughout this year. And in many ways, those protests can be understand, understood as a form of lament. Uh, I would say biblical lament adds a new dimension in that the, the protest often is directed at God. And so we have here in, in Psalm 10:1, why do you stand so far away, Lord, hiding yourself in time in troubling times? Right? It's protesting that God isn't showing up. And the protest here is in the form of the question of a question. But the question demands action, saying, God, come, come on. We, 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 we expect you. Uh, there's a force to this protest. And, and what biblical lament shows us is that the, that anger of protest, that ch and here, not just directed at institutions or policies or other forms of racism, but actually protest uh, uh, directed at God, the biblical lament shows us that's a legitimate part of prayer. And, uh, you know, a lot of us may be comfortable with protest actions uh, that focus on policies or institutions, but have you ever considered what it might look like to also direct your protest at God? Again, uh, a lot of us, the way we, you know, I grew up in the church. Yeah, I would guess many of you did, and uh, and a lot of us got messages that, that that's not uh, it's not it's not appropriate to address God in that way. But uh, but the psalmist and other writers uh, show us something different. They have an honesty uh, with the way that that they speak to God, and they don't hold back. Scripture shows us that that these can be um, an acceptable uh, expression of faith. And interestingly, in the research we did with these churches, uh, along the way, we had, we had the participants journaling at different points, and, and uh, we collected those, so we had some information, to some, some data that we, that we reviewed and, and chewed on. And, and we found that a number of our participants, af after going through an experience of lament, being invited into a space where they wrote prayers of lament, and and some different aspects of expressing lament. Many reported that this raw crying out to God, sometimes challenging God, actually, when they came away from it, they actually felt renewed in, in their faith. Several said they, they commented on how they, they felt that this way of speaking honestly actually helped them to feel more deeply connected to God. I thought that was a, a significant finding in the work we did. Um, on this theme of protest, let me share a quote from the author Rebecca Eklund, seminary professor, uh, who writes this. As protest, Israel's, Israel's lament calls on God to account for the way things are wrong in the world and demands that God listen and respond to set right what is wrong, mend what is broken, and bring light to the darkness, just as it is God's essential character to do, to do so. God is a God of mercy. Let there be mercy. God is a God of justice. Let there be judgment on the enemy and the evildoer. When Israel laments, 
It is God's faithfulness to God's promises that are at stake. And I want us to reclaim the lost art of lament because I see it as a faith-infused way to contribute to the struggle against racism. It's a struggle we have to engage, not just out there in the broader culture, we certainly have to engage it there, but we also need to engage it in our own churches and within ourselves as well. I wanna say just one more thing related to this, uh, to lament in scripture. And this isn't so much thematic as it is structural. And I've got two more uh, snippets uh, of lament here. And notice that lament can be, uh, in, in addition to all those themes we went through, lament also can be individual or it can be communal. So this Job passage is an individual lament. Why did you let me emerge from the womb? I wish I had died without any eye seeing me. Then I would be just as if I hadn't existed, taken from the belly to the grave. So this is first person. Right? It's very personal. And uh, you may, when we get to, when, we, when I invite you to write your own laments here in a, in a few minutes, uh, maybe it will be first person. But we also have examples of communal laments. And here there's plural language. I'm sorry, that, that first one is first person singular language. The second one is also first person, but it's it's a plural language, Daniel 9, 5. We have sinned and done wrong. We have brought guilt on ourselves and rebelled, ignoring your commands and your laws. So here the author is speaking for a whole community. Uh, and this is one of those laments of, of uh, repentance. There's penitence, penitence here related to this. Um, well, we're going to keep moving towards writing our own laments, which we'll do here in a few minutes. As I mentioned, you'll need uh, a pen handy and some paper. Uh, and I want to, uh, I would invite you to start thinking about this question. When it comes to racism, what is it right now, tonight, in this space, given the things going on in our world, given the things you've studied over the last months, given the things going on in your own life, what is it that you might want to lament? when it comes to racism. Maybe it's really personal. Maybe it's more on the broader societal level. Maybe it's something about how our church has been complicit in racialized patterns. What is it? So as you think about that question, I wanna show you a video clip. clip. And this is um, of uh, Pastor Anthony Powell. He's one of the pastors in our research team. And he's telling a story that for him connects to, um, to lament. And um, uh, this is from a, a video series that our team put together, uh, six sessions on this topic. And I'll say more about that later. But let me get started. This is about a three minute clip um, where Anthony tells a story from his life and how uh, and he starts to re relate it to lament. He doesn't write his own lament prayer in this, but, but it can help us start thinking in that direction. And the, uh, the woman, in this uh, is uh, Pastor Abigail that I mentioned to you already, and then I'm in it as well. So let me start this for you. So we're gonna continue our conversation on the intersection of lament and okay. racism, but I just wanna pause for a moment and just share a story from my own experience. Um, there was a time not too long ago where I was going to be taking my daughters to their very first father-daughter dance brother gotta show up at the doorstep with flowers for his special latest and so i'm coming back from working out in the gym um and so you can get the picture cut off shorts cut off shirt hoodie little sweaty little disheveled but super excited and full of enthusiasm so i go to the local flower shop in my neighborhood and as i walk in i see that the flower shop is relatively empty um the clerk is helping one customer and as she's engaging with this customer it's quite Quite easy to tell that she's throwing out the red carpet. She's giving him the royal treatment. She's taking her time. She's showing him different arrangements. Like he's having uh, just a great time with this clerk deciding for his floor arrangement. So I wait at least 10 minutes for this exchange to finish. Then once she's done, she helps that customer, sends him on his way, and I take a step towards the counter because I'm next. And she looks up from the counter, takes one look at me and says, 
can I help you? It wasn't the, can I help you as in like, how can I be of service to you? It was that, uh, can I help you as if I was lost? Mm -hmm. As if I did not know where I was. To which I began to explain, hey, I have this special night that I'm having with my girls. Um, and I'd like to pick out a special corsage for, for them. To which she responds like, okay. And I say, hey, I would love your help in figuring out what to get for my daughters. To which she then responds, how would I know what they would want, what they would like? Do you have any idea what they would want, what they would like? And so I start to say, well, yeah, one of them likes pink, one of them likes purple. And she stops me in my tracks and says, you know, um, I don't think that I can help you. I wouldn't even know what kind of things your daughters would like. But I do have a suggestion. There's a Vons right down the way, and I believe that they have a flower section. You might have better luck by going there and purchasing those corsages for your daughters. So as this whole interaction is happening, I'm, it's very clear that I'm not wanted. It's very clear that she probably took a look at this black man with dreadlocks and earrings and made some assumptions about whether or not she felt like I was worthy of her service. So I end that experience and there's all kinds of things that are being brought up within me. I'm angry, mm -hmm. I'm heartbroken. I'm disappointed because now I've wasted so much time at, with, at this flower shop with this clerk that I don't have time to go get my girls the corsage that their daddy wanted to present to them. So what do I do with this? What do I do with my anger at the clerk? What do I do with a gut punch when I think about my daughters not getting flowers from their dad? What do I do with the despair that this interaction brings up in me? The stuff, the stuff that goes on inside. What do I do with that? Well, I have learned through lament, I've come to see that lament in itself is an action it's a response to the questions that I have, to the experience that I just encountered. Okay. So we're going to continue oh. our conversation. Okay. Uh, well, as Anthony said, he, he found, you know, he goes on to say some more about that practice. But uh, for him, this was, uh, lament has, has come to be a powerful way of praying, of speaking to God, of expressing, uh, expressing what's going on inside of him. And uh, in, our, in those church summits that I spoke about, we had a time where people were invited to write prayers, just like I'm going to invite you to here in a moment. And I'd like to read a couple examples that come out of those summits. And people had index cards. So that's about the length. We gave them, you know, seven or eight minutes. So Nobody expected, you know, fine pieces of polished literature. That's not the point. It's just a, a start in, in expression. And so let me let me read a couple of these to you. Here's one that, that somebody wrote. Oh, Lord God Almighty, why? Why? Why do you allow us to continue to hurt each other physically, spiritually, emotionally? Help us to see the folly of our ways. Help us to take our cares and pains to you and not take them out on each other. You alone can change hearts. You, not laws, prisons, and guns, can help us stop hurting each other. Okay, so that was just a, not a very long prayer, but, but a prayer where this person was able to start pouring out uh, the, the feelings. Here's, here's a second one. You once took a people through a wilderness into a land of milk and honey, but I am a stranger an alien, a forever foreigner in my own land. Where are you from? How, how is your English so good? This is supposed to be the promised land, one nation under God. Why am I still homeless? If these aren't my people, who is? Do I have a people? Or will I forever be alone, still in this strange and weary land? <laughs> so those are a couple of samples that other people have uh, written. And now I've been building up to it. And uh, I wanna invite us into a time of, uh, invite you, if you're willing, to write your own prayer of lament. And um, I'll give us about, I'll be the timekeeper, we'll take just about seven minutes. Uh, so it's not very long, but uh, it's time to get started. And, um, 
I'm actually going to share a, uh, this is a, a pattern that we find in a lot of lament psalms. Um, and if it's helpful for you, you can follow the pattern, but many, but you're also welcome to say in whatever form you want to. The, the basic pattern in many lament psalms, uh, it begins with a direct address of God, involves a naming of realities, an appeal for specific action, and then a concluding affirmation of faith. Although I'll note there are, uh, while most of the lament psalms end with that affirm affirmation of faith, faith there are at least two of them that don't. They just end. And um, personally, I, I find those, I, I'm really drawn to those because sometimes I am so mad or so upset about issues of racism that I'm not always in the moment ready to turn to that affirmation of faith. Um, I'm blessed to be in a community with people who, who can hold that hope that sometimes when I can't, and hopefully I can do the same for them at other times. But anyway, this is the, the most common pattern does, does include that. And uh, so you can use that uh, pattern if, if you would like. And uh, I'm gonna uh, go quiet now. I'll be timekeeper, I invite you to write your own prayer of lament. And then when we come back together, I'll see if there's any, uh, if there's some who would be willing to, to share those. I'm not gonna call on anybody, but, uh, but we'll, we'll go there. So. Go ahead and, and if you're willing, uh, spend some time writing your own prayer of lament.
Okay, I'm gonna bring us back together and you can continue writing um, if you want to on your prayers. But uh, I would like to ask now if there's anybody willing to read something of what you wrote, the, the whole prayer or some part of it. Uh, and you can do that either by uh, raising your hand, by clicking on the reactions and then there's a raise hand button. Or if you don't find that, you can just unmute yourself and start sharing. Um, is there anybody who would be willing to go? Mary, do I see your hand? It's not really a finished product and it hardly has begun. Oh, that's because it's very strong, that's because I have very strong feelings. <laughs> so it, it doesn't. And oh, God, down the paper. Now I can't, well, it, it's, I can say it without hardly even looking at it. It's why can't, oh, Lord, why? How can you still allow the violence against others who some feel are different or below them? Why, why do you still allow them to murder and to kill these people? They are no different. They have the same feelings as I do. Why? You're the only one who can heal these people and make them feel the way that th those that they are batting down feel. And that's, and that's not the words I wrote because I can't really, <laughs> right now I can't read it. So I'm, Fine. my writing has gotten that. really bad as I'm turning, as I'm getting older. <laughs> oh, that's Thank you for sharing that and for, for being the first to go. And, uh, and as I, I said, we certainly I don't have very expect strong feelings on this subject, so I'm very sorry. I'm just really. <laughs> no, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Is there another person who would be willing to read, uh, read for us what you wrote, Mike? Yeah. Lord, I have been bound by my ignorance. By your grace, I have begun to see my failings and compliance. Release me, my God, to join in the solutions needed to lead me to the reconciliation and unity with my brothers and sisters. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Yeah, and even though we didn't take very, very much time, uh, already we're hearing some really powerful things come through in your prayers. Somebody else who'd be willing to read for us. Uh, is it Meryl? Okay, all right. <clears throat> oh God, I am so frustrated and feel so hopeless. What do I do with my own history, the history of being white and receiving endless benefits from being white? How do I recover? How do the people among whom I walk recover? How do those who have suffered because of my privilege ever recover? God, help me to recover and show me how to relate in new ways to those who, uh, I have caused to suffer. You alone, oh God, can bring about healing. Mm, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Somebody else, Jana. Oh, we're, you're on mute though. We have to get you to unmute. I'll unmute myself. Okay, thanks. Dear God, why is there so much hate in our country today? Why are all these people, this mob in DC so angry how can this be happening today? Please, dear God, show them, show us your love, your light in all this darkness and division. Please, dear God, stop the hate and the evildoers. 
I love you, dear God, and know that you can help us change our world. Amen. We have time for another one or two. Oh, we got more time than that if others are willing to share. Anybody else uh, willing to take a go at it? I will. Okay. Loretta. Arita. Arita, thank you. Oh, God. I lament so much at this time. I could go on for hours naming my lament. I lament the people who have believed false claims, who have longed to return to the white power past, who fear the future. I appeal to you for help to help truth prevail, to blow the embers of hope, the embers of justice, the embers of goodness into the fire which cleanses evil and permits new life. Like the controlled burns which maintain healthy forests, please bring to us out of this time of trauma the fire in the soul of all who watch that horror Help us to turn that fire into controlled burns to be used to get rid of the underbrush of evil and bring healthy life back to all of us. Only you can do this, O oh God. We cannot do it alone, but we need you to give us strength to work to be that cleansing fire. Mm, thank you, Arita. Appreciate that. Were you giving grades? I give that an A plus. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, well, thank you for for uh, for those of you who who shared. It, it really is significant to hear one another's uh, laments. I find. And uh, now I'd like to shift and and uh, just open it up for for your comments and your questions and your observations. Uh, if you have any questions or if you, I'd love to hear you to comment on the process of writing the lament, what that was like, any, anything you want to bring to the group at this point. And you can, uh, again, raise a hand either physically or with the raise hand button. Or if I, if those of us here miss both of those, you can just unmute and start speaking. Susan, did I see a hand? Yes, thank you. Um, I really um, love the idea of lament about racism from the point of view of a person of color. I'm having a little bit more difficulty dealing with it as a person of privilege and whatever a lament. One of the things that in um, that I had been told about lament is that if you can do, do something about it, then it's not so much a prayer of lament, but a prayer of confession. And so I maybe that's the, the repentance lament. Is that what the intent is behind that? And I find it a little bit, I, I think, easier to come at it from that point of view. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for those comments. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I, I don't really, I don't quite, uh, I guess I see lament as expressing the individual's feeling or the community's feeling in the moment. And I don't think that it, I don't think it necessarily from what I see, it doesn't necessarily divide out along the lines of whether it's something we can do something about or something we can't. So for myself, when it comes to lamenting racism, I think I have a huge responsibility to act. There are things I can do, but along with that, uh, I think it's it's appropriate when when I'm feeling, you know, the emotion of it to 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 call out in those ways. Yeah, thanks for bringing that idea to us. 
there are others. David. Oh, we're having a hard time hearing you. Would it be possible for you to, to put the screen, uh, show us again, the, the format, I want formats a little strong, but the components of lament that you have observed when you had those four points. The, uh, thank you. Yep. Some people may have access to the Presbyterian women's study of this year, which was called Lament into the Light. It's all about lament, and those four elements are cited in that document. It's a, it's a good study guide. Any other comments or reflections on your experience writing a lament or questions? Joe. I have found lament. Um, we did the women's study and it really um, brought lament forward. And it has been so helpful in this um, time of crisis in our country, in our world, in the pandemic. And even personally, my, I have a sister who lives in another state and she is just so frustrated what's going on. But she said, as a Christian, you know, she said, I, I, I can't complain. I can't, you know, I have to just always take it. I just always have to be upbeat. And it's like, no. And um, I shared the study with her and she just wrote lament after lament after lament. And it has been just so freeing for her because she's still, I mean, she's addressing God, but yet it's okay. It's okay to cry. And it's just been a wonderful gift. Good. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, John and Connie's screen, John. Um, I really like the idea of the bus tour, concluding with the uh, worship service for lament. Um, I think that can be done in lots of different places. Uh, and I think it would be really impactful for me. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And you can use the time on the bus for different, you know, at one point we showed a video, at one point we had some discussion things. Because uh, the bus had, you know, had video capability. Yeah. Any other comments for the group tonight? I will share. Um, let me share the screen one more time. I mentioned. <clears throat> So yeah, I did mention that uh, the, the group, uh, our team has put together a, a six part video teaching series that comes out in about, uh, in about a week, it will be out. Um, it, it includes six video sessions, they're 15 to 20 minutes. There's a leader's guide. This is the cover of the leader's guide. And then there is a participant journal and um, so if uh, this is designed to be used in, in you know, church community groups or small groups in those settings. And so um, just a resource I thought I would, I would share with you if, if it's helpful. Um, and yeah, it'll, it'll be, there's some free stuff on Herald Press or Amazon, but I think it goes live on the 26th. All right, any final questions or comments? I'll turn it back over to the official news. 
I want to say thank you. This has been really, really good. Thank you, Rob. It's good to be with you. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you, Rob. So are there no more questions? Comments? I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Could I comment? Yes, please. Okay. Um, you know, this, um, I haven't been exposed to this um, in this way before. And I feel like it's opening a whole new possibility. So thank you very much. Mm. I appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. I, I have a quick question. I had a little girl in my classroom, first grade, and she kept looking at me and feeling my legs. And she looked up at me and all of a sudden she said, you're white. Now, if that isn't a stop moment in your life, I don't know what is. She was just, she kept, for, for uh, every time we were sitting in circles, she would be, she, she kind of touched at me and looked at me and she finally looked at me and that she came to that conclusion. Now, how do you, this, this is a, a question for, this is how children learn. This is, she's never been taught that there's anything wrong with this, but she, she didn't even realize it until she kept, what well, you look white, but she, is it rubbing off was her, I, her feeling, I think. Hmm. Yeah, it's an example of, of uh, how these things come up as questions for young ones. And, and, and that's an opportunity for us then to uh, ask them questions and, and guide them in, in how they process it, right? And, uh, rather than reinforcing, you know, some of the messages from the broader culture. Yes. How, how it might definitely. we narrate for them? It's like, yeah, you know, maybe you, you, you know, offer a, a new narrative to what they've observed. Oh, yeah. yeah. And this was in the day when you would hear on our playground, White Patty. So yeah, this was really a time of a lot of teaching, a lot of mm -hmm. understanding. I see uh, Arita's hand up for sure. And I see Juan is unmuted. So perhaps we have Arita and Juan wanting to say something. I was going to suggest that our presbyteries organize a bus tour like that. It sounded like a tour of our of our history of racism and that to back. Um, I mean, David, you could, what you have suggested, what we know about the housing effects in Pasadena, for instance, but we could highlight that in a bus tour that would be very educational and, and impactful, I think. My, my two cents. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rita. Yeah, I agree, Rita. Um, Rob, thank you and thank you, everyone. I think this has been very, very moving. Um, and, and I wish we had the opportunity of sharing more of what, uh, what we felt, uh, and how we, what we wrote. Um, so that kind of leads to my question. Um, you know, we, we are, we have our time constraints and our limitations. Um, Rob, what has been your experience after the, after the process? Have you been have you incorporated lament into that particular group or your communities of faith, your churches in, a, in an ongoing basis uh, or kind of just um, an exercise, a moment or a time and a pilgrimage, so to speak. And then, and then kind of uh, going back to, um, to the regular activities, hopefully with some kind of change um, internally and, and in our perception of, of how, um, God wants us to live, but um, is this an ongoing process, Rob? Do you see this as something that can be incorporated into the life of the church or just something that you would recommend for, for a gathering or a, or a trip or something like that? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that question. I, I definitely think it should be an ongoing part of the church. I don't know that, you know, I don't think we should live in lament always, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. uh, but there are times where, where it's, it seems like the situation really uh, invites it, uh, situations that come up. And so a couple, a couple things. So in terms of 
uh, incorporating it into the life of the church. Uh, actually, in that handout that was emailed out with you, um, the last page is a, a psalm of lament worked in a liturgical prayer that's appropriate for use in a church worship service. And so that's one way that uh, you know I've seen and tried to keep folding in lament. Um, another way related to this specific process of having congregants write their lament prayers, uh, one thing we've done is collect those and then use those in future worship services as some, you know, to, to read some of those as part of our prayers of the people. Um, and then I think that there are different seasons of the, of the church year that really lend themselves well to it. So, you know, a, a session like this really sets us up for uh, coming back to it during, during Lent, right? When, when it is a time of introspection and repentance. And, and uh, so we can build in, in the seasons of the church calendar, we can build on, on what we learn in other times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, great ideas. I wanted to mention a couple of things. One is there's a group in the press, within the presbytery preparing a prayer of confession for, to be distributed, to be shared this, and, and used by congregations as, as they seek, uh, as they see uh, fit. Um, and, and that's the um, uh, Developing Leaders of Color uh, Task Force. And also we're working on a, on a, a Lent a devotional series and hopefully yeah, I think it both those are wonderful opportunities for us to mm -hmm. share um, uh, both our our brokenness and um, our sadness and our hope mm -hmm. in Christ, and uh, that's that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Those sound like great resources. Any other comments or? Well, John and Connie again, I think, have someone had something to say. Oh, yeah. okay. I wonder if, uh, if you, Rob, could talk a little bit about how you walk into lament when you have people in your congregation or in your group with very different perceptions of what's going on, what the issues are, where the pain and the brokenness is. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really important to consider that. So, um, First of all, lament can be directed at, at a lot of different things. So in my, my work has been specifically related to lament and racism, but uh, you know, certainly there are other things that go on in, in the life of a congregation that, that may call for lament. Related to racism, I think it takes some setup. I, I mentioned a few times that, that lament requires remembering. And so I don't think it probably works to show up on a given Sunday with no pre-work and no background and, and you know and ask the congregation in a deep way to stay, step into lamenting racism because like you said people are going to be kind of all over on that um, so it, you may need to to do some of the the pre-work of, of remembering and then uh, one of the things I find about lament is that it is fairly open and so even after that pre-work you know that work of remembering, if people aren't all at the same place, uh, it, that's actually there probably aren't going to be right. <laughs> they are going to be at different places, and we found that in our work with with these congregations, not everybody was at the same place. But but lament it, it's not prescriptive, so people can can say what fits for them. And and I think you know if, if I'm talking with somebody who doesn't view racism the same way but they're willing to enter into it. There's something they can say about why racism isn't good. It might not be the same reasons I have, but, uh, and, and it's invitational. If somebody isn't ready to do that, or they don't wanna lament, then oh, okay, that's, you know, it's, it's, we, we, invite, we invite one another, we invite our people into the space, um, and that's as far as we can, can lead. Um, and then people decide if they want it enter into that or not. Thank you. Yeah. Rob? Yes. Yeah, I just want to express my appreciation to uh, Connie for asking that question. I, 
I've gone to a fair number of church gatherings over the years, and I know that prayer or lament or anything that is uh, liturgy can be used as a weapon to make everybody think my way and nobody can answer back. Uh, you know, and I find myself being put in situations where, you know, we're, we're supposed to, we're confessing something that I don't feel, A, I've done, and B, if I have done it, it's probably a pretty good thing that I did it. I'm not talking about racism here. I'm just talking about across the board. And, and instead of answering, oh, Lord, hear our prayer, I feel like saying, oh, Lord, here we go again. Because mm -hmm. I've been through a lot of it. So I really appreciate, uh, Connie, your sensitivity uh, on that, that we don't use liturgy uh, yeah. as a weapon to uh, communicate things that people can't answer back to. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, and I, I certainly have experienced that myself where... Uh, and, you know, it's interesting because we have all these communal laments in the Psalms, and yet uh, there are times when something, you know, a communal prayer is constructed in the way you just described, Dave, where, where it's like, oh, I'm not sure I enter into that in quite the same way. So it, that does take some sensitivity. In terms of, uh, I, I think there, well, a couple things. One is I think we can always use Psalms of lament, even even when they don't name my exact experience, they name somebody's experience. And, and I can pray it. If I don't always pray it on my behalf, I can pray it on somebody else's behalf. And, and that gets us off of that. Uh, I mean, these are our scriptures, right? These are, we, we can, we don't, uh, we might argue over a, a, a liturgical prayer somebody wrote, whether it fits me or not. But, but we, we have to figure out one way or another how to use our Psalms together. Um, Another piece that I think is kind of interesting to build into, if, if there are ways we have people write their personal laments, what, something along the lines that we did tonight, uh, as those are read, uh, it's, it's harder, if I hear somebody else uh, offering their own personal lament, that's not something for me to argue with, right? I mean, if I'm asked to, to read, read a lament and I might not agree with it, that's one thing, but if somebody else is reading, that's their experience. And, and it doesn't seem to put up the, the resistance quite the same way, um, you know, as, as ask as it could if, if a communal prayer is not constructed appropriately. Okay, we're just about out of time. So any last minute comments? All right, well, I'd like to thank Rob. All of us thank him. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for having me with you. And thanks for all of you being willing to show up here month after month to, to engage the work. Yeah. And thank all of you for being here. I just want to mention uh, next month, we will be having on the 11th at 7 p.m., we'll be having our sixth educational series. And it's titled, Starting the Conversation, What Does the Bible Say About Justice? And it will be presented by John Ilian, who is up in my right-hand corner, and he's waving. <laughs> and um, do you have anything to say, or just that you'll be there? You said you said it all. That's good. <laughs> okay, that's good. We hope we see all of you um, next month. And Rob, thanks again, and maybe you'll join us next month. We'd love to see you. Thank you. thank you, everybody, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Yes, thank you very much. Bye.